Hello everybody, welcome to Wine World TV, the best wine show anywhere. I'm your host, Mark Fusco. Before we get started, make sure you are smashing that like button and subscribing to the channel. Every like and subscription helps build the channel. Even better, spread the word to your friends about the best wine show anywhere. All right, welcome to Freestyle Friday, where I could do what I want. Do you like sake? I do. I'm liking it more and more each week at this point. <laughs> anyway, uh, I like it somewhat. It's not my go-to in general, but I do enjoy well-made sake. Today's show will be the third part of three shows on sake. Today we cover more terms, sweet versus dry in sake, how acidity and umami factor in. I'll also cover sake's aromas, flavors, food pairing, and basic sake service. So let's get comfortable one more time, grab your favorite sake, and let's have some fun. Let me once again address Japanese pronunciation here for a minute. For the most part, the sounds for Japanese are fairly familiar to English speakers. We share a lot of the same sounds. As with any language, there are some that are not familiar and can be difficult. Many words have a Western version of the pronunciation that we understand, but it's technically incorrect in Japan. I will do my best with staying as true to proper Japanese pronunciation as possible, but I may slip into what I'm used to saying or using the more Western way of pronunciation. In addition, I'll put the Japanese word using the most common Western spelling in a lower third when I first use the word to help reinforce each term. I may do this more than once depending on the word and if I feel it, it needs it. I'll also include the English meaning. I've included a link to a YouTube video that helps explain how to pronounce Japanese words if you're interested in upping your game. I highly suggest it and it helped me out a lot. So for the past two weeks, I covered a lot of information about sake. Let's recap from the last couple episodes, kind of previously on Wine World TV. <laughs> I'm sorry. Sake has been around since at least 780. It is made from rice with premium sake made from up to 80 different varieties, the most popular being Yamada Nishiki. It uses what is known as MPF or multiple parallel fermentation, meaning the conversion of starch to sugar and sugar to alcohol happens at the same time in the same vessel. The heart of the rice grain is where this starch lives and the more you mill the rice, the higher the quality of the starch you get. This translates into higher quality sake. As you go up in the quality pyramid, the sake changes from being earthy, rustic, and savory to more fruity and floral. The addition of brewer spirit means the prefix junmai is dropped and it adds a minerality to the sake while making it lighter. Sake has two main styles, sake with brewer spirit and sake without. Sake without will have the prefix of junmai. At the bottom of the sake pyramid is ordinary sake known as futsushu. It will typically have brewer spirit but it is not required. Then the first level of premium sake is Honjozo and just Junmai. It will have a Seamai Buai of mil or milling ratio of 70% or less. Next is the same, but either at a lower Seamai Buai of 60% or has some special characteristic not found in the brewer's normal sake. The word Tokubetsu will precede either Honjozo or Junmai. Then comes Ginjo with a Seamai Buai of 60% and then Daiginjo with Daiginju representing the highest quality and the lowest mill ratio of 50%. This number can get down to around 10% for most premium sake. Besides clear sake or seishu, there are some other special kinds of sake. Namazake, which is sake that has not been pasteurized. Ginshu, which is undiluted sake. Moroka, which is unfiltered sake or sake that has not been carbon filtered. Nigore sake or cloudy sake. Koshu, which is aged sake. Taruzaki, which is sake aged in wooden barrels or bottled in wooden casks. But that's not all when it comes to terms you might encounter or need to know regarding sake. Let's go back to Wikipedia for more. Shibo itate, or freshly pressed, refers to sake that has been shipped without the traditional six-month aging or maturation period. The result is usually a more acidic or greener sake. Fukurozuri is a method of separating sake from the leaves without external pressure by hanging the mash in bags and allowing the liquid to drip out under its own weight. Sake produced this way is sometimes called shizuku sake, meaning drip sake. This is usually only reserved for the highest quality sake, jumai daiginjo. Tobengakoi 
is sake pressed into 18 liter or four imperial gallons or 4.8 US gallons uh, bottles called tobin, with the brewer selecting the best sake of the batch for shipping. Amazake is a traditional sweet, low alcoholic Japanese drink made from fermented rice. Doburoku is the classic homebrew style of sake. It is created by simply adding koji mold to steamed rice and water and letting the mixture ferment. The resulting sake is somewhat like a chunkier version of Nagora sake. Jizake is locally brewed sake, the equivalent of microbrewing beer. Kuroshu is sake made from unpolished rice, that is brown rice, and is more like Huangiju or Chinese yellow wine I mentioned last week or two weeks ago. Teisehihakushu is sake with a deliberately high rice polishing ratio. This is generally held that the lower the samibuai, the better the potential of the sake. Circa 2005, Teisaihakushu has been produced as a specialty sake made with a high samibuai of around 80% to produce sake with the characteristic flavor of rice itself. You might also see these terms on a label that help indicate the taste and flavor of sake. Here's a graphic from Ozeki Sake Company to look at while I explain the next two concepts. There's also a term called Nihonshudo, or sake meter value. You may see it abbreviated as SMV. This is related to specific gravity, a term associated with beer. Specific gravity is a measure of density. In this case, it's compared to water. The standard of measurement is governed by the Japanese measurement law. If sake at 15 degrees Celsius or 59 degrees Fahrenheit weighs the same as water at 4 degrees Celsius or 39 degrees Fahrenheit, then the sake meter value is zero. Sake that is lighter compared to water indicated with a positive meter value such as plus two, and sake that is heavier than water is indicated by a negative meter value like negative three. Higher sugar content is what makes sake heavier than water. So negative meter values can indicate sweeter sakes and positive meter values can indicate drier sakes. However, the alcohol content also changes the specific gravity. So the alcohol content of the sake should also be taken in consideration. Furthermore, some sugars such as ogallosaccharide are not sweet and the acid level can also mask the sweetness. Therefore, it is difficult to identify sake is sweet or dry, relying solely on the sake meter value. The numbers will usually range from minus three for sweet to plus 10 for dry, though you'll find numbers outside that range. The graphic I'm showing you goes from minus 15 to positive 15, and the sake I'll be tasting appears to be minus 20. Originally, zero was the point between sweet and dry. Now plus three is considered neutral. In addition to that, you may see sando. Sando indicates the concentration of acid. This number is equal to the millimeters of titrant required to neutralize the acid in 10 milliliters of sake, similar to grams per liter measurement in wine. It has a range of one to two. Usually no units of measurement are appended to the number, just like the SMV number. Next we have amino sando or amino acid value. This indicates a taste of umami or savoriness. Sake with more amino acid tastes rich, less amino acid tastes light. Then there is the amakara value. Amakara refers to the sweetness or dryness of sake. Instead of the sake meter value, the sweetness or dryness of sake can be expressed more accurately in terms of the relationship between its glucose content and acidity. This is uh, measuring the amount of glucose at grams per 100 milliliters. Acidity dry is less than 0.3. Medium dry is 0.3 to 1.0. Medium dry is 1.1 to 1.8. Sweet is greater than 1.8. Know what doesn't have any glucose? My line of merchandise from WWTV and what I call my outstanding line of merchandise. My outstanding line is all about positivity and is based upon my re response of outstanding when I'm asked how I'm doing. The outstanding line is all t-shirts for now. I have polos, t-shirts, and accessories for the WWTV line. Check out this sweet logo t-shirt. Both lines are getting more variations in the future, so look for them on Zazzle. Link below in the description, so please check them out. Okay, let's talk more sake and less shirts. Like wine, beer, and spirits, sake can have many flavor notes. 
Here is an aroma and flavor wheel from the Comprehensive Guide to Japanese Sake. As you can see, there is a wide variety of flavors and aromas associated with sake. Let's use the guide to go into more detail starting with aroma. First is fruit. Apple, pear, banana, melon, lychee, strawberry, citrus. Ginjo shu, and I haven't really talked about this, but you can drop the shu um, at the end of these words. So you just put it ginjo, but it, the proper term for these is ginjo shu. Um, anyway, ginjo shu is rich in aromas suggestive of tree fruits such as apple and pear or tropical fruits like banana, melon, and lychee. It is these aromas that are referred to as ginjo ka. The element ka means aroma. The aroma comes from the esters produced by the yeast in the fermentation process and is analogous to the secondary Roman wine. To make sake with ginjo ka it is necessary to use highly polished rice and to employ painstaking care to create the right low temperature conditions for fermentation. This brewing technique is known as ginjo zukuri. Next is spice, so clove, cinnamon, fenugreek. Some varieties of koshu or long-aged sake may have an aroma suggestive of clove, cinnamon, or fenugreek. Nuts are another type of aroma found in some koshu varieties of sake. This will be reminiscent of almond or walnut, while some forms of namazake may have a hazelnut aroma. Taruzake, or sake that has been stored in cedar casks, has a wood aroma called kiga, which derives from the cedar used in the cask. Some sake varieties have an aroma evocative of green grass or roses. Certain types of junmaishu have a grainy aroma similar to that of the rice from which sake is made. Koji has an aroma similar to mushroom. This comes through in certain types of namazake and young sake varieties. Caramel, honey, brown sugar, dry fruits, soy sauce. Because sake contains large amounts of amino acids and sugars, it acquires color in a sweet burned aroma due to mired reaction during aging, which I noticed in the last sake, and I knew there was something about it. I knew Maillard was going on, but the last sake didn't really, last week's sake didn't really have any color. Anyway, this ranges from a honey-like aroma to one resembling soy sauce, brown sugar, or dried fruit in the case of koshu varieties that are allowed to age for several years. Acid, vinegar, yogurt, butter, cheese. Butter, I totally forgot, you could have butter in this, I guess. Uh, depending on fermenting conditions, some varieties of sake have an aroma similar to butter or cheese or a vinegar-like aroma. Moving on to flavors. The previously mentioned amakara or amakuchi or karakuchi for sweetness or dryness. The balance of sugars and acids determines whether sake tastes sweet or dry. Increasing the acidity will reduce the sake sweet taste even if the amount of sugar remains the same. This is the same for wine and is a major part of my episode on sweet versus dry wine a few weeks ago. You should check it out. No tan or no jun or tanarei or body. The sugar level and acidity also affect the sake's body. Sake with a high sugar and acid content is regarded as rich or heavy. Amino acids and peptides also contribute and high levels of these result in a full-bodied sake. A full body variety may be referred to as having koku or goku or goku mi. Two Japanese terms used to denote the level of body are tenorei or in nojun. Tenorei conveys the notion of light as well as clean and sophisticated. Nojun, on the other hand, conveys the meaning of full or rich along with complex and graceful. You're probably familiar with the concept of umami and that it refers to savoriness or deliciousness. A key amino acid associated with umami is glutamic acid. Sake is richer in amino acids than wine or beer and contains a large amount of glutamic acid. Adding glutamic acid to sake, however, does not boost the sensation of umami. This is probably because the umami of sake derives from a harmonious blend of num numerous amino acids and peptides. Nigami, or bitterness. I've talked about how I prefer nigori as it's less bitter. My use of bitter may not truly convey actual bitterness. Bitterness is not a desirable trait in many varieties of sake, but it is one of the characteristics that give long-aged sake's complexity. Kime, or smoothness. This is an appropriate level of aging that reduces any roughness or pungency to produce a smooth, mellow sake. Kiri edo, or the finish, or the aftertaste. In high-quality sake, regardless of whether it is sweet or dry, 
heavy or light, the taste is expected to vanish quickly after it leaves the mouth. This is referred to as kire. Unlike wine, a long finish is not regarded as a desirable characteristic of sake. Now, like wine, an indicator of quality is a balance in the wine. No element dominates the wine. This is the same in sake. The toji is looking for a light body without it being a watery sake. The toji is also looking for a balance between aroma and flavor. For instance, a sake could have a fruity aroma, but if the aftertaste is singular or even considered too complex, then that sake will not be thought of as a high quality sake. Ideally, a sake will have elegance and resonance. These are the ones that get the best scores. Sake isn't immune to faults either. Let's cover some of the most common. Zatsumi is an unrefined or undesirable taste. As we just finished covering, balance or harmony is a key requirement of the taste of sake. A disagreeable, unbalanced taste that cannot be easily identified as bitterness, astringency, or umami is referred to as zatsumi. Sometimes zatsumi results from the use of inferior ingredients or poor brewing technique, but it may also be caused by poor control during distribution. If sake is exposed to light or high temperature during the distribution stage, the level of zatsumi will increase along with the changes in color and aroma. Light is the enemy of sake, just like in beer. Wine doesn't have as many problems, but it can also have issues with light. This is known as light strike. The amino acids and vitamins that are plentiful in sake degrade when exposed to light, giving the sake an unpleasant musky smell. It will also discolor the sake. Hineka refers to an oxidized or stale odor. In addition to acquiring a caramel-like smell, sake that is stored under high temperature or conditions favoring oxidation develops an unpleasant smell like rotten cabbage or gas. This is caused by sulfur compounds in the sake. It is believed to be emitted by substances resulting from the metabolism of amino acids containing sulfur. A musty or corky smell. Now, sake bottles don't use cork, but sake may on rare occasions acquire a corky smell. As with wine, this is caused by 2,4,6-trichloroanisole, or TCA. Traditionally, sake brewing involves the use of many wooden items, and the buildings at many breweries are made of wood. If chlorine-based fungicide is used in the wood, the lignin in the wood produces 2,4,6-trichlorophenol, or TCP, which is converted to TCA through contact with mold. This may contaminate the sake during the production or storage process. This is how screw cap wines can be corked. I don't know how often it happens with sake, but a wine with a screw cap or other non-cork enclosure can end up being corked. It's very rare, and I can't remember ever having a corked wine that didn't use a cork, but it happens. Now, how do you store sake? Preferably in a cool, dark place or refrigerated. I can tell you I didn't do that with my sakes. I mean, they weren't stored in direct sunlight or in a room with constant light when I got them home, but they were stored in an equivalent of a normal retail environment. I bought them about two to three months ago. Since cork isn't used, humidity is not a factor like it is with most wines and beers. Now, sake bottled in brown or green bottles provide better protection than clear bottles when it comes to light strike and a completely opaque sake bottle or bottles packed in cardboard boxes similar to beer will prevent it. As far as temperature, ideally you want to store your sake at 15 degrees Celsius or 59 degrees Fahrenheit or less. If you don't have room in the fridge or a wine cellar, find a cool dark part in your home. When it comes to ginjushu, it is more susceptible to temperature and therefore should be stored in a refrigerator rather than a cellar. Namazaki deteriorates especially rapidly and should be refrigerated at no more than 5 degrees Celsius or 41 degrees Fahrenheit. However, storing Namazaki for too long results in a pungent aroma similar to the smell of hazelnuts or other nuts due to enzymatic oxidation. Long-term storage also increases the sweetness, umami, and heaviness, destroying the taste balance. Now, once you open a bottle, it's best to drink it as soon as possible. Bottles like these aren't hard to finish. They are basically two servings. Larger bottles like the 720 milliliter or even larger should be refrigerated after opening. They'll stay fairly fresh for a few days, but if you take a few weeks to finish it, it will still taste fine. It just won't taste as ideal. You can also use something like a vacuum in to help slow oxidation. What about sake service? Well, let's talk about that. First, let's talk about some of the foods you'd pair with sake before we get to these. I'm definitely referring to that guide, 
uh, on this since my experience with sake is limited and much of this will involve seafood, which I don't eat as many of you know. Not all of it, but a lot of the food pairing does involve seafood. All right, there are four important roles that sake can play when matching with seafood. Striking a balance. Sake with similarities to the food enhances both, such as rich sake for rich food. Producing a taste. So sake consumed with food can create new tastes. Bringing out a taste. Sake can bring out hidden flavors in the food. Or cleansing the palate. Sake can wash away food aftertaste and refresh the palate. This is not unlike how you would pair any beverage with food. Because sake is less acidic than wine and has less astringent taste, it goes well with a wide variety of dishes. Because it abounds in amino acids and peptides, sake is very effective in bringing out the different tastes in food. When consumed with fish dishes in particular, sake suppresses the fishy smell, moderates the salt taste, and allows umami to spread throughout the mouth. Now you might be thinking, this is enough for me to give that a try. Doubtful. But it's interesting that sake might make seafood more palatable for me. I'm not rushing out to try it. Yeast, koji fungi, and lactic acid bacilli are involved in the production of soy sauce and miso, which are also used as seasonings in Japanese cuisine. Umami is also the dominant taste in these seasonings. This means they share flavor characteristics with sake, which is believed to be the reason they go well together. I kind of mentioned this in the last couple episodes. Yeast, lactic acid bacilli, and molds are also involved in the production of cheese, which is rich in umami resulting from the breakdown of proteins. Cheese, therefore, goes well with some sake varieties, especially aged sake. Now, this I can get behind. I like cheese. But this all makes sense as to why sake goes well with Japanese cuisine and, by extension, most other Asian cuisine. It's the reinforcing of the concept of what grows together goes together. And this exists all over the world. Whatever the dominant local beverage is almost always pairs well with the local fare. Or there's at least a wider regional or national type of food it pairs well with. Now last week I talked about serving temperatures. I won't repeat that here. Just remember that premium sake is normally served chilled or room temperature. And ordinary sake is served hot. So what do you use to drink sake? Well, really anything you want. But if you want to do it the right way, then you'll need one of the following. Use something like a choco or ochoco, a small cup like this. A tokuri is used to pour into the choco. Normally, this is how you see hot sake served. Small cups help keep the sake hot. To heat up the sake, you would put the tokuri in hot water. So imagine this is a hot water bath, and you would put this in there to heat it up. Though we're not going to do that because that's my spit. <laughs> anyway, also a microwave is considered acceptable and is very likely how most places serve it unless they have a constant hot water bath going. However, if you're going to use a microwave, it's best to put the sake in something like a coffee cup instead of a tokuri. The shape of many tokuri creates an uneven heating of the sake. Masu, a wooden box made from either hinoki or sugi. Both are types of cypress found in Asia, with sugi being native to Japan. The masu is 180 milliliters and was originally used to measure rice. Being 180 milliliters and that being the traditional serving amount, the sake is filled to the brim. It's common in restaurants to use a 180 milliliter glass inside the masu. The glass is filled until overflowing and the masu is there to catch that overflow. Alternatively, the masu is placed on a saucer and said to catch the overflowing sake. Many times both the glass and the masu or masu and saucer are completely filled by who's serving it. Sakazuki, these are saucer-like cups mostly for weddings and other ceremonial occasions. Kopuzake, these are glass tumblers common in bars for room temperature sake. When all else fails, use what I'm using, wine glasses. I've mostly seen white wine glasses used. From my understanding, since sake is a lighter beverage like white wine, it doesn't need a bigger bowl of a red wine glass. I haven't seen one in the wild, but there are also footed glasses made for sake now. As far as traditional service of sake, Traditionally, one does not pour one's own drink. I got nobody else here. Uh, this is known as tejaku, but instead members of a party pour for each other, which is known as shaku. This has relaxed in recent years, but is generally observed on more formal occasions, such as business meals, and is still observed often for the first drink. 
Back in the day, sake was only brewed in the winter, not unlike other beverages before the advent of temperature control. Now, sake can be brewed year-round. However, there are some artisanal sakes that hold to a bit of tradition. The most common thing is the hanging of a sugitama. This is a globe of cedar leaves that was hung traditionally outside a brewery when the new sake was brewed. The leaves start green and then turn brown over time, reflecting the maturation of the sake. These are now hung outside many restaurants serving sake. The New Year's sake is called shinsu or new sake. And when initially released in the late winter or early spring, many brewers have a celebration known as kurabiraki warehouse or warehouse opening. One last thing, you might have noticed that sake bottles don't hold to the same sizes as wine bottles. This is due to the traditional serving size of 180 milliliters. So the bottles are unusual sizes. The most typical are 180 milliliters, 300 milliliters, and 720 milliliters. Larger ones are made too. Since sake is really classified as a wine in the U.S. or beer, depending on what you're talking about, the TTB makes an exception to its regulations concerning wine bottle sizes. So in this case, for this purpose, it's classified as a wine, but then in other cases, it's classified as a beer. I already covered that in a previous episode. Know what we need to do now? Taste his last sake. Okay, that does it for the informational part of the show. If you want a much more detailed account of everything I've talked about, I encourage you to read Guildsom's Expert Guide if you are a member. If you're not a member, but are in the industry, then I encourage you to join. It's the best $100 a year you'll spend, really. You don't have to be in the industry to join. You could just be a wine geek and just want to learn more. Now, you also could, and I should have a link to it below, the, uh, the complete guide to sake. So that's another outstanding resource. So let's get into this last sake. I decided to do this last one since it is Nagori. This is typically the style I like the best as, quote, real sake comes across as too bitter to me. Much of the time, though, I know I'm probably using that word incorrectly, as I mentioned earlier. Pop quiz. What's the legal term from sake? Seishu. Nagori is a sweeter sake and more approachable. In the interest of time, I won't go through any of the detailed history of this sake. I've linked to the website so you can read upon it. And let's just get to tasting. So what am I tasting? Well, I'm tasting the Miyashita Sake Brewery Sacred Mist Sake for about 16 bucks. It is a Hanjozo. Nigorazaki style. Okayama Prefecture. Seimai Buai is the mill or the milling rate is 70%. Rice type is Akebono, which is different than the other two. Contains brewer spirit. Nihon Shudo is, or the sake meter value is minus 20. Kind of off the sweet scale, right? Or kind of off the sale sweet, right? The ABV is 15.8%, so another even higher alcohol. The acidity, I don't know. I couldn't find it on the, um, on, the, on the label or on the website or anything. So let's get into it. Now, I'm going to put these away. Um, I do have to mention that somebody I work with um, who is part Japanese, um, she had these, and I told her I was doing a show on it, so I wanted, like, examples. I'm not going to serve it in that um, just because I'm going to serve in the white wine glass, but I just want to show you what these, what these kind of look like. Plus I know I had some pictures of other, of other, um, whatchamacallits, of other vessels, other things you can drink it out of. So we'll put those out of the way. So remember I talked about how you either shake it or don't shake it. It's like, you don't know which one I'm not going to shake it. I'm just going to open it because I, the last time I had in the gory, Nagori Zaki. Um, I don't remember it being shaken up or shook. So we're just going to pour it in here. Now, um, I didn't, I didn't put, I didn't put my little camera up top for the, for top down stuff. Um, but you might be able to see it's cloudy. All right. Especially because it's a black shirt, it should be good. Side note, I'm using a blue screen today. And the main reason I used the blue screen was because this is a green bottle. And I had some wine, I had a wine review with the Riesling. From, remember the Riesling from, uh, from Australia? It was a green bottle. Do you know how I kept that green bottle green? <laughs> yeah, it took two plus hours of editing to do that. Um, the quick and dirty version is you create what's called a mask and you put it all the way around whatever the object is. And 
it allows you to, to do whatever you want in the mask. In this case, keep the bottle green. Well, that's great if it just sits there on the table, no problem. But when you move it around like I did, that was the fun part. So I bought a blue screen so I can avoid that type of stuff. And I used it on this whole session because I want to see what it looks like. Oh, guess what? These... <laughs> okay. I probably just realized that I put blue in front of blue. So I'll have to take pictures of these. I will have already taken pictures of these. Uh, so you see what they look like normally because they are blue. I didn't realize that. Oh, well. Joyful. Because I'm not doing the... I'm not going to do the whole... Well, maybe I did. Maybe I, I, you know, I probably did the, the, um, the uh, masking of it and I just didn't bother. I probably didn't bother animating it when I lifted it up. Okay. Anyway, let's get into this sake. So it's a little more, it's a little bit more aromatic than the last two, but it's not like super high aromatics, right? You get more of the rice uh, aroma. Um, it's not as much of that rice candy as I talked about the, from two weeks ago, but you still get that little bit of, you know, that extra bit of rice rice quality and sweetness. There's also a um, kind of a candy. There's a bit of a candy uh, aroma. Kind of like a Laffy Taffy, a banana, the banana, you know, like I mentioned it in one of the other sakes, forgetting, well, I didn't forget, but I knew banana was one of the things you could get off of this. But yeah, you have like this kind of banana, almost um, bubblicious kind of uh, aroma. But it's also a little bit... Um, Bananas Foster. Not as much caramel, but yeah, like a sweet banana. I know bananas are sweet, but like a like a like a sweetened, like a banana's even sweeter. You also have some other fruits in here. You've got some apple and pear. Also a bit of peach. Yeah, you also get that kind of sour green apple, almost like the almost like those hard candies type of thing. I just taste it. I think the reason why I like Nagori sake or Nagori in general more than your regular sake is that it tastes more like a wine and almost like um, like a fruity style Riesling, I guess, but it's, I, it's really not a good analogy, but like a fruity style wine that has a decent amount of acidity to it but a balance with a sweetness to it. Remember, this is a minus 20 on the sweetness scale. So it's a sweet sake. So I guess a Riesling is a good analogy. It's kind of like a cabinet Riesling. The sweetness is there, but the acidity is balancing it. You get that rice candy, that green apple, that banana, that, um, that type of stuff, a little bit syrupy. Um, so probably where the bananas foster thing coming from. Um, I do feel like I get a little bit caramelization. So I mean, Let's be honest, the sake is probably probably drinking it two years after it was made. And it was it sat in a distributorship and then it sat on a shelf for a while and it sat in my house, um, probably for six months or whatever. So there's probably a little oxidation going on here, but I, I like it. I think it I think it has complexity. It's like a wine, like you know, an aged wine, even though it's only two years doesn't really do that much to a wine. But you know, this extra few months or not perfectly ideal storage conditions. I mean, I think it has some complexity to the, to the sake. That's my story of sticking to it as to why it's doing that. But yeah, and there's, um, yeah, that green apple. There's a smoothness, a richness to it. It's, um, it's not tart by any means, though you really taste the acidity. You can really feel it. So even though I didn't have an acid number for this, I'm going to assume that it's on the extreme, it's on, I think, well, I think the ones, no, I think two is the highest acid. I have, I don't remember. Whatever, whatever the highest number is, is probably that highest number or near that, near that high acid number. A little bit cherry to it. 
Yeah. Oh, well, there's the 320 train. You can hear that in the background. Depends on how much noise reduction I've been doing throughout the episode. That train, that train whistle was loud. The train whistle was loud. I think I mentioned it in another prior episode that the both crossings are almost exactly 1.2 miles away or something like that. You know, straight line. As the crow flies, as they say. It's a good sake. Let's, you know, let's get back to this. I really like it. It's really tasty. Yes, I did say it's 3.20 in the morning. Um, because I just want to record stuff. Yeah, I like it. I think if you're getting into sake, I think this is a great way to get involved in tasting sake because you get used to the rice flavor. Um, and it's it's more approachable, maybe not with a minus 20 on the on the SMV, but I would say you know, something like this is a good way to get, introduce the sake and then you get into the to the drier sakes, right? Or the bitter sakes. It's kind of like, you know, when I talk to people, you know, they don't like something too bitter, but they don't want it too sweet. That's kind of like how I am with sake, you know? Um, but I know the difference between it. Anyway, I think Nagori is a great way to get introduced to sake, though it could come across as a little too sweet. So, I mean... It's always just get used to the new, a new set of flavors, stuff that you're not used to. That's good. All right. Well, you know what? That's going to do it for today's show. If you enjoy what I'm doing here, make sure you hit the like button, subscribe, and then tell your friends. And until next time, drink some awesome sake.